Whovians. They're everywhere. I'm a Whovian, you're probably a Whovian. So, the best thing to do is to do the Doctor Who tag, and that's good for everyone. I became a fan of Doctor Who when my mum first showed me a classic Who episode with Sylvester McCoy. Now, pretty much most of my family are Whovians. My mum used to hide behind the settee whenever the Daleks came on, and it's just kind of something that's really been implemented into my nature. So yeah, so the Sylvester McCoy episode was when they were doing reruns on a channel which I can't even remember. And it had leopard people and it was like, oh my god, what is this? A, a time traveller, a short little time traveller in a police box. And it was all odd and fascinating for like a young child. And then I'm seeing like the Peter Cushing movie and then Doctor Who came back with Chris Eccleston and that was just fabulous. And I've been a strong Whovian ever since and I've now watched every single episode. That's a difficult question. Can I split this up into New Who and Classic Who? Seems I feel like that's a lot easier then. Like, New Who, hands down, it's gonna be David Tennant, because no other Doctor in New Who compares to him, really. And for Classic Who, I'm stuck between two, and that's the third and fourth Doctor, John Pertwee and Tom Baker. Just because Tom Baker was so flamboyant and goofy, and his smile was amazing, and his scarf was stupendous, and John Pertwee was just kind of kick-ass and badass and he was just really cool, apart from his little yellow car. My favourite companion, that's easy enough, Sarah Jane Smith. Both classic and new who, she's one of the most interesting companions. And she kind of turned the companion from being this screaming damsel in distress to being awesome, really. She thought for herself and she kind of fought for what she believed in. And that is why she got the spin-off series and no other companion with the exception of K9 got a spin-off series. Favourite episode, Midnight. Midnight is my favourite episode just because of how well it's written. It's just genius. It's kind of taking the Doctor out of his comfort zone, which is weird for a Time Lord who's lived for so long. But you take the Time Lord, the Doctor, out of his comfort zone. He loses his greatest weapon, which is his voice. And that's a little bit terrifying, really, isn't it? The, the, the saviour of the universe is slowly being beaten by a creature which is archaic, which is unevolved. And it's just a really interesting dynamic for an episode. It's kind of creepy as well, it's just in this one room. And, of course, Colin Morgan's in it, who is Lillian. And then the saviour of the episode is a person whose name we're not even told. And it's so daunting. Wasp and the Unicorn. Don't like it. It's just bad. A lot of fan service. Like, oh look, it's Agatha Christie, the thing he mentioned ages ago. It's just a bit of a naff episode, really. Although I do also have a dislike for Girl in the Fireplace. Not because it's a bad episode, but because of the placing of it. It comes right after School Reunion, where the relationship between Rose and Ten is set up. And then you kind of jump into the Girl in the Fireplace, where the relationship is almost forgotten about. He ends up snogging Madame de Pompadour and it's just odd. Least favourite companion. Most people say Martha here, but I like Martha. Martha was kind of cool. If I was going to choose a least favourite companion, it is going to be Clara, because Clara is boring and beige. She's just a dull character who seems to be superior whilst not being superior, and it's just, she. Blair. Uh, I don't know. It's just, no. I don't like her. I don't know why either, because I like Jenna Louise Coleman. But, Clara, I don't like. Do you know who I'm going to blame for this? Moffat. If I was given the chance to be a companion, I, I would be kind of a fun companion, I think. Just not really taking anything seriously, just enjoying myself and seeing the wonders of the universe with my camera and taking a lot of pictures. Instagram pages full of space and the future. A final front. Wait, no, that's the wrong thing. Would I be able to fill an Instagram with that? It could be like a rule not to do that. Though it could be like, oh, look, I'm really good at CG. This isn't real, and it actually is real. And I'm just kind of rambling now. But yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, you're you're expecting me to say the Weeping Angels, aren't you? Yeah, you are. I know you are. But no, it's not the Weeping Angels. It's Fashta Narada. What's scary about Weeping Angels? 
they don't exist until you look away. Oh yeah, that that's quite scary and a little bit creepy. But then they touch you and they send you back in time and feed off your time energy, which isn't actually that scary, is it? You're not dying, you're getting sent back in time in to a time you've probably learnt about. So you can survive easily there. And surely, yeah, they they feed off the time energy which stops the paradox, but surely you can create a new timeline by changing events of the past? That kind of works in Blink, doesn't it? Because kind of things are normal until she goes back to the past and then she alters the way things happen. Though I'm, I suppose you probably ultimately get to the same goal. Right? I feel like I've lost the point of the question. Vashta Narada, yeah. They're scary. They're piranhas of the dark. You have this innate fear of the dark and it's because of Vashta Narada. And they're just creatures. They're, they're not thinking. They're not planning for world domination. They're just creatures. And that's the scariest thing. They're just attacking because they can or because they're hungry. And it has such a nice line of it's not irrational, it's Vashta Narada. Which just blows off your tongue. Ah, oh, so good. I'm inclined to say the Azorbaloth, just because Peter K. Peter K. That being said, it, it's done for a nice thing. So I'm not gonna kind of go down on that episode or that villain. I am gonna choose Prisoner Zero as my least favorite monster, just for the fact that it's a bit anticlimactic. It's just a bit dull, isn't it? It's not great. And the main villain of the episode, really, is the guard who almost destroys the planet rather than Prisoner Zero. Prisoner Zero just kind of takes control of coma victims' bodies effectively and kind of imitates them. It's not that scary and it's just a bit naff. Anyway, that's a quick look into my nerdiness and my geekiness and my hoovianness and I need to stop saying this. Hope you enjoyed and I'll see you soon.